I am searching for the international tax treaty law meaning of beneficial ownership. And uh, I shall be making some technical remarks um, which are connected with uh, the current uh, interpretation of the OECD model convention and commentaries. Uh, next slide. Um, you can see that uh, I will also be focusing on the relations between the domestic tax law and tax treaties. Uh, it's the previous slide, one slide back. And the reaction to, to tax avoidance. And then I will be making, I will be giving a little uh, Russian flavor from a non Russian perspective. Um, so I will be making reference of the Cyprus Russia double tax treaty which uh, is apparently given rise to a number of issues in this country. Um, I am uh, clearly not Russian and I do not know your system, so I hope that the technical remarks that I'll be making um, during the next minute are uh, taken into account your context, which I am not familiar with, and I am sure that the Russian colleagues who will be speaking after me will have the opportunity to say where I am mistaken and certainly nothing of what I am about to say is meant to lack respect to your beautiful country, language and culture. I am just a technical expert and I am humbly making some technical remarks. Um, next slide. So I think it's important that we have that we ask some preliminary questions. And if we want to search for an international tax treaty law meaning, we have to understand what terms mean in the context of a treaty. And therefore, also, why beneficial ownership was included in tax treaties. That is something which um, I'll try to answer during this um, question, during my presentation. Uh, many people, including the OECD, say that uh, it is an anti-tax avoidance clause. I am making the point that it is a clause on the correct determination of the entitlement to the reduced withholding tax in Articles 10, 11 and 12, which can also uh, indirectly counter phenomena like treaty shock. Uh, another preliminary question is about whether the OECD model convention defines the concept of beneficial ownership. We don't have a definition in the model convention, but the fact that we don't have a definition doesn't mean that we, there are no relevant elements that we can draw from the context of the treaty in order to understand what beneficial ownership may be and what it may not be. So to exclude things which are not necessarily connected. One of the points that I want to make is that beneficial ownership, in so far as we interpret as a concept that determines the entitlement to the lower withholding tax in Article, for instance, 10, but also 11, 2, and 12, that is something which is not necessarily connected with the evidence of avoidance. Um, the fourth preliminary question is about whether there is an international tax meaning, and here I would like to say that we have several judgments from several countries, and that countries like Canada are in particularly active in uh, reconstructing this international tax <coughs> law meaning. And essentially, it seems to me that the key issue is insofar as the recipient of dividends, interest, and royalties at the time of the payment is free to dispose of this payment and has neither a contractual or any otherwise factual obligation to pass this payment immediately to someone else, that 
person should be regarded as the beneficial owner. Now, of course, if you're talking about dividends, then who do you think that the dividends can be paid to? The shareholder. But that's normal. If we don't consider this to be something that belongs to this concept, then we would say any company uh, which has a shareholder or any company at all will never be the beneficial owner. And that is clearly not what we uh, can see in the context of the OECD. Because the beneficial ownership, in particular for dividends, is in respect of inter-company dividends. So, a company must have a shareholder, and at the end of the day, there will be an ultimate owner, but that is a separate thing. We are in Russia, and Russia is not an OECD member. And I think that uh, we should also consider that what the OECD says does not bind Russia. So Russia is fully free to decide uh, how to interpret and apply its tax treaty. So I'm not here to plead for the OECD or to say that the OECD should interfere with what Russia does. However, I am here to plead for legal certainty. So we have to understand and achieve some level of legal predictability of what words mean in tax treaties. And I think, you know, it's something which takes us also to the fact that under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, if one country signs treaties in several languages, and one of this treaty language prevails over the other, then there is no excuse or no possible uh, legally acceptable ground that uh, can prevent the interpretation from uh, being taken into account in a language other than the official language. I shall be making some examples in the part concerning Cyprus and Russia as to the relevance of the English language. So, summing up my preliminary remarks, I don't think that beneficial ownership uh, can be interpreted in a narrow meaning connected with the meaning that it can have on property law in the Anglo-Saxon systems and in common law. There is no one around the world who would take a different view and uh, I also say that there is no one around the world that would say that beneficial ownership right now in treaties following the OECD model convention would apply outside of 10 to a 11 to and 12 3. Just want to make the point that you know Australian treaties are different, but that's a different context. It's not the one uh, I would say of Russia. Next slide, please. It was included in 1977, and. Uh, since we were also talking about languages, you know that the OECD model convention is in two languages. And uh, the French wording is not exactly matching the English one. Uh, you see, in the English you refer to ownership, and, and you include the word beneficial as an adjective, as opposed to uh, you know, somebody who's not the beneficial ownership. In French, you talk about beneficiary, and then you use the word effective. Now, maybe there is no one in this room who is fluent in French, but I think this word, effective, makes a lot of sense uh, when it comes also to this country, which includes some reference to factitious career, and that is something which can be important also to understand, that if you look at the English wording, you don't see it. But if, if the OECD model convention is in two languages, and you have to get something out of these two languages, then the nuance, effective, should be taken into account, because both languages of the Model Convention uh, closely reflect uh, the meaning of what was included there. As I said, the object and purpose is to preserve taxing powers of the source state and secure lower withholding taxes on intercompany dividends only for companies that can actually dispose of income. So once more, we are only dealing, if we're talking about dividends, we're only dealing with intercompany dividends. So the fact that we say that the company then passes that dividend on to another company or to the shareholder, for me it's normal. Because if, if we have a company paying and a company receiving, the receiving company must be a company because we're talking about intercompany dividends. So any interpretation that says that uh, you know, there is another shareholder uh, will, as long as the receiving company has no contractual or otherwise equivalent factual obligation 
to pass the dividend on the day in which it receives, that is something which does not per se create problems. So this is also to see how I see the context. Because even when you don't have a definition, you have a context. And there are things that you have to take into account. And uh, clearly the commentary on the OECD model convention provides a lot of uh, confirmation and relevant elements. But because we are in Russia, which is a not a, in EU, uh, sorry, an OECD member state, I think it's important that we understand that even if we leave aside the commentary, the context could not otherwise change. I have to some extent the feeling that the different wording used in your bilateral treaties, in your beautiful language, the different wording is to some extent influencing the developments and the interpretation and the application without taking into account the context. Next slide, please. So, I have said that I want to develop arguments regardless of the commentary, and I must say the commentary helps. It goes more than clarifying, and the commentary has been changed a number of times. And we have problems in some countries with static interpretation and dynamic interpretation. Um, here, you know, really the commentary has changed a lot. Uh, and that uh, which has changed, in my view, is the relation between beneficial ownership and the possibility to apply anti-avoidance clauses. So, the general wording uh, in 1977 has been uh, developed further across the years. For instance, uh, I see two major moments, 2003 and 2014, in which we have to uh, see what has changed in the commentary. And in 2003, they say in, at the OECD that there have been problems in understanding the concept of what was paid to a resident. I would say that the year in which we understand completely what the OECD means in respect of beneficial ownership is 2014, which is very recently. And as you can see, there is a specification concerning what a conduit company may be and the fact that, uh, as you can see from the slide, as a practical manner, matter, it has very narrow powers, which render it a mere fiduciary or administrator acting on account of the interested parties. Very narrow powers. Now, this word very narrow powers is perhaps a little bit uh, difficult to understand, because very narrow powers, it means that it doesn't, in fact, that it has no possibility to dispose of that dividend. And I think, you know, no possibility, again, must be interpreted in the light of the criteria that I have mentioned. Is there a contractual or, or otherwise equivalent factual obligation to pass this dividend? Also, in 2014, we understand that uh, beneficial ownership does not deal with other cases of treaty shopping. So there can be a problem of treaty shopping also when somebody is the beneficial owner. Let's go to the next slide, please. And there you see uh, Article 1 of the OECD Model Convention. That is connected with the entitlement to treaty benefits. And only since 2003, we have a position of the OECD which says that states do not have to grant the benefits of the DTC in the presence of arrangement that views the convention. There's a strong position since 2003. There is a strong position also allowing domestic <coughs> to intervene in that context. However, um, and uh, uh, you can see it from the, uh, the third uh, uh, blue arrow in my slide, uh, the OECD has made it clear that states should not lightly assume 
that the taxpayer enters into abusive transactions. Maybe you think that I am crazy about French because I'm making all examples, I like French as a language. No carte blanche means that you don't give states just the power to say, okay, let's apply our anti-avoidance measures and let's consider that all persons who have shareholders in a different country from the one of the recipient of the dividends, okay, that is tax avoidance. No. The OECD has made it clear, and we see it also in the paragraph 12.4 of the commentary on Article 10, that uh, there should be no situation. So if you think, as a state, that a state of source, that the recipient in another country lacks substance or lacks power to dispose, you have to give evidence. And that is particularly important if you want to achieve legal certainty. Time is limited, of course, and I wish I could stay here to speak for long, but it's a very intensive day and I have to respect the colleagues in particular, the ones who speak after me on this topic, so I would like to move on to a little bit of, uh, let's say, Russian tax treaty flavor. Next slide, please. And uh, this slide uh, takes us just to one example um, uh, of connected with your treaties. And I have selected the one with Cyprus because I think it's giving rise to a number of practical issues, and I also want to avoid, um, you know, when when a professor speaks, then they say, oh, this is a merely theoretical, or, you know, this kind of issues. I am very much concerned with issues of legal certainty and predictability, as Professor Vinitsky said before, when he was making his short presentation on the issues of uh, international tax law, and I am also concerned, as, uh, prof as Professor Kalanova, about the fact that in some cases there may be issues also when uh, treaties are in languages uh, other than Russian. And for instance, the Cyprus-Russia treaty is, is trilingual. And then, you know, we have Greek, and we have Russian, and then we have English prevailing. Now, regardless of whether it's published or not, the, that is, and I think she is also concerned about this situation, there we have one language that prevails over the other. So, uh, you take into account Greek, you take into account Russian, and, uh, uh, and there, as you see, I put it this is so you may say, Fakticheska ya prava na dividendi. But there, uh, you know, the point is really that from the English version of the treaty, we don't have this very strong point on the factual or actual situation. We have something which is having additional nuances, and the nuances are connected with the power to dispose. Power to dispose means dispose in favor of the shareholder. Otherwise, what do you do with the dividend? It doesn't mean that you are obliged immediately to pass this on, but if you have an investment, then you pay the investment back to the shareholder. So I think, you know, it's quite an important point. I have noticed, and Victor was saying that we have our IBFD database. Fortunately, it's making things much easier because you know we just click and, and get the, and can become aware of the fact that there are protocols. I have noticed that in 2010 uh, there has been a protocol out there, and this protocol is in fact um, introducing a guard in the DTC, which means Double Taxation Convention. It is effective since 2013, and I understand that from 2013 on, the interpretation of this treaty can be changed because we have to take into account the gap. But between 1998 and 2013, there is a big issue, and that is the OECD context has evolved on tax avoidance from 2003 onwards. It has become clear in 2014, what about the years before 2013, and in particular connected with the treaty that was signed before 2003. So I am aware, I was uh, last week in South America with Professor Linitsky, and we, uh, he was presenting some Russian cases concerning uh, beneficial ownership, and I am aware that uh, there are enormous issues concerning the interpretation of beneficial ownership. I have gathered the impression that to some extent this situation is connected with the fact that uh, uh, courts, at least of first instance, are uh, biased by the Russian language 
And I am aware that there may be also a problem of potentially uh, likely assuming the existence of um, tax avoidance. And maybe the answer to these cases is really to work hard on giving evidence of whether uh, there is tax avoidance in a specific situation and not just say the shareholders are from a different country and because the shareholders are from a different country we don't have a treaty with that country, you know, that's clearly treaty shopping. It can be treaty shopping but it might, does not necessarily need to be that and therefore I think it's important and here I am uh, going to my conclusions and I kindly asked to change the slide and put the final slide. I think it's important that we work on legal predictability. So if we put some words in the treaties, those words have an international uh, tax meaning, and uh, certainly you have your domestic law, and your domestic law affects your treaties. Uh, from 2013 onwards, it is easier because you have put the Article uh, 29 in this uh, specific treaty, which I have mentioned, but until then, I am from a technical perspective and with all respect for your country and I please understand, you know, I, I just want to be technical and it's not nice that I just say words without going in depth in issues. I am a little bit concerned with the fact that there may be, at least from the cases that have been already published in English, there are some issues in which there is a disconnection with, um, with the international tax. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr.